time we will have to spend together. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me commend Paul and his team members. Paul has done an excellent job for me. So he has made my work very, very easy. He has he's read everything. So I'll just talk around it and then we'll, I'll try as much as possible to be engaging. Uh, if you have questions, I know there is somewhere. Uh, is there anywhere they can put in questions? Let me Sir, see. In a group where the questions will be dropped, then we'll let you know. Oh, okay, great. Was, okay, so um, I will do my best not to bore you. Uh, I want to talk about HR strategy. And um, like I said, I will do my best. <laughs> and again, let me thank uh, my God for the opportunity afforded me uh, to be on this call uh to share my thoughts and everything can you all see my screen please yes we can sir okay so this is the outline you can see the outline now it's still on your fourth slide sir okay so uh let yes me... we can see the outline I was, I'm trying to just do something here. It yes, seems... we can see the outline now. Sir. Okay, so it seems it seems Telegram is a bit different from my. I'm used to my Google Meet and Zoom, Zoom but uh, <laughs> don't mind me. All right, so um, I want to talk about strategy. Um. Many years ago, so uh, a group of friends uh, woke up one morning and they decided they wanted to um, sorry, so they decided they wanted to start a business and they said, we want this business to do sales, we want to sell houses and that was what they wanted to do. They raised money and they went and they started building. Midway into the building project, they ran out of resources and it became really tight. Okay, they tried everything they could. It didn't work. And at the end of the day, they just had to sell. It gradually got heated. Uh, the friends, at the end of the day, some of them just walked away, some were angry, they started suing each other. And somebody will ask me, what happened? What happened that led to that? Do you understand what happened that got to that point? That friends will now have to get to the point of suing each other and all of that. And I will say, without missing words, that life happened life happened that's number one number two they did not in capital letters they did not define what they wanted to do so i'm just testing a few things sorry don't mind me i'm trying to test a few things to be sure that i've never used telegram before so don't mind me all right so life happened and then strategy happened so they decided they wanted to sell houses and in that in making that decision they didn't decide, do we want to build our own houses and sell? That's one option. Do we want to buy houses and resell? Buy built houses and resell? Do we want to buy fairly completed houses, complete it and sell? Do we want to start from scratch? All those details were missing in their conversation. And that caused a lot of rift among them. You see, as simple as those details can be, those details is very, very, very important. And that is your strategy. Wherever you are, as whether HR or, or admin or whichever role you will end up with or whichever role you will become, it is very important whenever you end up as a business owner or as a HR manager, 
it is very important that the strategy of that business is clear to you, it is clear to everybody how that business is supposed to exist. Some of us work in non-government, some of us work in non-profits, some of us work in profitable, some of us work in different organizations. What is the strategy? But that is the overall strategy of the organization. What about the HR strategy? HR strategy defines what HR is supposed to be. What the people are supposed to do. See, I've come to understand something. No matter how small the dream, no matter how lofty the dream, you need people to run it so you can write that down. No matter how small or no matter how big, you need people to run the dream. You need people to run your vision. You need people to run your business. And that is why you need the HR department. So if that person, if that your boss tells you, what is the justification for HR department? You need people. You need people. You're, he will not drive the car by himself. He will not clean the office by himself. He will not write the ledgers by himself. Yeah. He will not do the recruitment by himself. Every, he will do everything by himself. At the beginning of the business, you might do all of that. After a while, you have to let go of those responsibilities. So, strategic human resource management is an approach to the development and the of implementation of HR strategies that are integrated with business strategies and support the agent. See, as simple as that, that, that has solved a lot of problems for a lot of people. Number one, it must focus on what? Implementation of HR strategies. What if this HR tool must have a strategy? So the question is, what is your HR strategy? What is your HR strategy? A notion of how integration or to fit between people, that is human resource, and business. So how do we merge the people organizations with the business itself? How do we merge people in accounting with our business objectives? The people in uh, finance with our business objectives, the people in marketing with our business objectives, all of these have to merge together and achieve a goal. So then we have a long way to go. That fitness is very, very, even for, for the company that says they are equal opportunity employer. It is also, at the end of the day, you will see they have job descriptions and job requirements. Job descriptions and job requirements. These two things help streamline the people that we do the job. So there's no way our accountant will not have ICANN. If he doesn't have it, he can't do the job. He can't put stamp on a financial documentation and financial management statements. He can't do all of that. He can't because he doesn't have it. So we need to understand. So my job here today is to take you through the quality of the theories you have read. Do you understand? So let me try to move as quick as possible so that... Okay. So, um, so Mr. K, Mr. K, Mr. K, can you hear me? Yes. yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? So, I'm, I'm trying to put it on projection mode, but it is not giving me what I want. Is you that know, um, can you see it on projection mode right now? No, you are still on the um, regular mode. You are not in presentation mode. Sorry, I didn't hear you well. You are not in presentation mode now. But I guess... You are not in presentation mode now. Okay, so let me do yes. something. Because I'm still trying to understand Telegram. Let me stop sharing my screen. All right, you can see my case now. So let me yes. put it on presentation mode and then share again. Okay. Yep. Um, I apologies for this. Okay.
You can see it now, right? We can, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, I want to talk about the benefit. What is the benefit of strategy? Why do we need strategy in HR? Fundamentally, from what I've said, you need to define the people that will fit into your organization. As long as those people are not defined, your strategy is just, <laughs> we are just playing like what Fred would say. We are just playing. You need to define the people. It will improve your acquisition. It will improve your process. Take for instance, um, very recently, somebody came to meet me. I need an admin manager. I need this, I need that. And I was like, so tell me the kind of person you need. And she goes, somebody that can do the job. That's vague. It helps narrow down. So it will improve your talent acquisition. As simple as those job requirements are, it helps improve your process as an HR person. So if you are recruiting people to fit into a particular role, when the person doesn't meet the terms and conditions, what is it? You, the person is screened off automatically. Once the person doesn't meet the requirements, it's screened off. So it saves you time. And then it improves retention because now from Nigerian labor law, we'll get to all of that as we proceed. There's something that you know we call duty to provide work. The duty to provide work is the duty of the employer. And retention is one major way to increase retention is to provide satisfactory work. So why will you hire an IK, a chartered accountant and you give him the work of an accounts officer? You are underutilizing him. It's only a matter of time. No matter how much you are paying him, he's going to find somewhere else. Do you understand? Now, number two is enhanced employee engagement. There is satisfaction at work. There is reward. There is satisfactory reward. There is motivation at work. Then better planning. There is something a lot of HR managers don't do. And that is planning. We are ending the year. A new year is coming. A lot of HR managers are not doing anything in, in terms of people planning. Next year, your company is going to roll out objectives and everything. But what is the role of HR in all of this? Because we despite all the rolling out of objectives and all of that, we need to plan and have an annual people calendar. What is your calendar like for training, for development, for workforce, for workforce acquisition and all of that? And then finally, increase productivity and uh, uh, profitability. Now, what are the perspectives of SHRM? We still need to go back to SHRM. But they are the regulatory body for uh, human resource management across uh, some parts of the world. A very high regulatory body. Now, there's a universal perspective that Paul had talked about, there's a contingency and there's a confidential perspective. Paul did a good job talking about this. Now, some HR practices are better than others. And so a lot of organizations acquire it and call it best practice. However, depending, uh, uh, we are in Nigeria. Uh, we know that one thing that doesn't work in Nigeria is the law of supply and demand. So many times, these best practices, we try to implement them. And it's always difficult. It's always almost impossible to implement them. Because while they are universal, the situation we find ourselves in this country will not allow us to implement it satisfactorily. Let me give you an instance. COVID, COVID happened in 2020, thereabouts, 2020 to 2021. They're about and for those who worked with international organizations about that time, they got significant benefits. So you hear COVID allowance, you hear inconvenience, you heard this. They were paid huge monies. In fact, I knew my friend bought a house from some of those monies. However, for those of us in Nigeria that work with Nigerian companies. What 90% of Nigerian companies tried to do was what? They tried to streamline workforce. They started changing, they started doing this, they started cutting salaries. And since you are not coming to the office, why should I pay you? 
and all of that. And those are legitimate reasons because things had changed. Now again, we're having another round of economic uh, challenges in Nigeria and businesses, rather than increasing salaries directly, guess what they are doing? They are cutting staff. They are cutting staff. So there are many times the universal perspective may not work, but it exists. And why does it exist? It exists for us to be able to advise. Oh, this is the best way to handle this situation. This is the best way to handle this situation. This is the best way to handle this situation. The number two is contingency perspective. Now, this talks about consistency of your policies as HR manager. Primary, primary consistency factor is the organization's strategy, and it is described as vertical fit. Paul had talked about this. I still want us to talk about some other things now. And I have a case study for us. Then the third thing is configurational perspective. This is a holistic approach with emphasis on the pattern of your practices and other variables in the organization. So, best model. There's something about best practice. They say this is best practice. When we want to, uh, for those of us that have been in it for a while, when you want to, there's something we call justification. So we do a lot of justification for the management of our organizations. And then you hear something like, this is best practice. This is how it is done. This is best practice. This, we've looked around. It is universally acceptable. For instance, employment security. In Nigeria, we don't have that. <laughs> Especially if you work in the private sector. You know, uh, our laws are still very good. And you hear that. I, I just don't like the way this guy works. Please, I don't need him on my team. What does that mean? It's time for the guy to go. Uh, those are the realities we find in the market. Those are the realities we find in Nigeria. But that is not best practice. If a person is lagging behind in a particular way, there are things we call performance improvement planning, P, or performance development practice, I mean planning, PDP. It is set in motion to aid the employee. Did you try with this? So things that are best practice anyway, there's a hiring process. There's a hiring process. You want to go through the process. There's a process where you don't just bring somebody and hire based on referral. No. There's a process. There's a documentation. You do assessments. You do psychometric testing. You do all of that. There's a process to it. Best practice, self-manage things. We don't micromanage. If you're a manager, you, you don't micromanage. When you give the direction, you allow for creativity. There's something that I've learned of recent. It's, you know, there's this thing we learned in management that um, the reward for good work is more work. Then we, I learned this from one of my mentors. He, was, he said something. He said, give the most difficult work to the laziest person. The person is going to find the most creative way to solve it and move on to being lazy. And everybody was like, ah, lie, lie, it's not possible. But when I read the book where he read it from, I understood the justification. It is good you allow teams to manage themselves. While reporting is important, it is good you allow some level of activity. Then high comp compensation contingent on performance that your compensation, for you to demand high compensation, there must be performance. It's best practice. If a guy is doing well, what do you do? Well, let him feel happy. You understand? Uh, training, and pro uh, training to provide skilled workforce and motivate workforce. You know, in this part of the world, again, I'm, I'm doing this because this is supposed to be a coaching section. I'm going to expose you to what, I've worked with a lot of companies and I've seen a lot of them. So you will hear, uh, Sam, we need to do training for staff. How much is it? The budget for the year is 20 million. You're like, eh? Ha, it's not possible, no. How many times? They'll say four times a year. All the staff, the entire budget, 20 million. And then they will cut and cut and cut. And, cut. and there's always this question we ask as HR managers. They say, if you don't train them, they are supposed to develop, they'll tell you they're supposed to develop themselves. They are supposed to, they are supposed to, they are supposed to. And we always ask them, if we don't train them and they, they, they can go, we'll find skilled people higher. I said, what if they don't? So you don't train your staff, 
and they decide to stay with you. So you'd be left with what? Low quality people, low low uh, low motivated people, and what? And they're supposed to achieve organizational goals as compared to their colleagues who are regularly trained, regularly motivated. You understand? Those are the realities in the market sometimes. The reduction in status differentials. This is <laughs> Nigeria is a case study. And I'm trying to be as real as possible because I know some of us, a lot of us will get jobs in Nigeria. And you will see some of these things. It's our jobs to go in there and change it. It's our jobs to go in there, make recommendations to management and change it. Information sharing, for instance, we don't believe in information in Nigeria. We don't believe in teamwork. When you know something, you know all you can, can all you get and sit on the can, it is your own. We don't believe in sharing information. But one thing I always say, when you have information like that, just go on Google and type it there. It will show you the number of millions of people that have thought about it and have solved it. So you are not the first and you won't be the last. Information sharing is best practice. Now, there is a model called best fit model in HR. It's a strategy too. It is called, we look at the person that fits the We look at, that's in recruitment. We look at the person that fits the role. We look at the situation. So the situation in Nigeria is different from the situation in Ghana. It's different from the situation in Cameroon. It's different from the situation in Mauritius. It's different from the situation in Italy, in France, in the United States of America, in China. And interestingly, it's different from the situation in North Korea. Across the world, there are situations that are peculiar to countries, to regions, to states, to, in fact, the situation in Abuja is different from the situation in Lagos. If you've been to both cities, you will understand what I mean. Both cities are different. It's different from the situation in Port Harcourt. So we are looking at a, a case where our HR processes and our HR strategies align strictly with what the organization is saying. So my HR standard aligns with what my organization is pursuing. Take for instance, um, um, I'm trying to think of an organization. Uh, Unilever just left Nigeria, right? Is it Unilever? Yes, they just left Nigeria. And imagine if the HR manager had a plan, had the HR plan to increase their marketing, uh, marketing staff. Yes, the company was already rounding up. They are already writing to round up business in Nigeria. What it means is that those things don't align. However, immediately management has announced that by the end of 2023, we'll be out of business in Nigeria. What does that mean? The HR manager will now need to begin to look at how do they offboard their Nigerian staff? What are the future plans for them? What, how do we engage the process such that it does also hamper the, uh, uh, these people or even the economy, we, even though we need to hamper the economy anyway? The HR strategy must align. It must fit with what management says. The notion of best practice assumes that there are universally effective HR practices that can be readily transferred. Let me give you an instance. I always like, like to go to recruitment. It's, is this easiest thing any HR manager can do? That there is a recruitment process. So, first of all, how, is, how does the recruitment cycle work? You have a need, there is a need for a particular skill. The ad, uh, management approves it, and then what? It goes on, uh, it goes to HR department. HR department writes to the department to tell them what kind of person do you need. They give you a responsibility and job description. HR puts out an advert, HR collects CVs, sees the CVs, does the assessment, does all of the process until the person is finally uh, recruited, uh, hired and onboarded. There is a generally accepted process. This is it. There is a process a generally accepted for training. What is the process? We do an analysis, maybe after appraisals, we check. We see that there is a skill lacking in somebody or in a group of people. We need to do this, or 
we know by next year we need to achieve ABC. So we need to train our people to be able to do it. Do you understand me? I hope you understand what I'm saying. All right. So what model here include life cycle model, strategic model, and competitive model. Basically, I've explained these three in all I've said. However, there are things under it. Innovation, quality, and cost to me. That now, these are things that are always considered when you want to pick up the best fit model. That if I look at what is universally acceptable, where does it bring in innovation in what I'm doing? It is universally acceptable for people to employ this. You are looking for. In fact, let me push it. I'm going to. I'm going to be very blunt for us. In this part of the world, it is universally acceptable. We are uh, tilted towards the male gender. So you want to hire a man first before you hire a woman on some particular roles. But you know that very recently we saw it's been around where we see female mechanics. And people will be like, a mechanic that's a woman. And then it just speaks interest. I want to see. I want to see it. That's the innovation there. Because at the end of the day, does gender really apply to skill? That's, those are questions that HR managers are trying to answer. Then the quality of the goods you are delivering, the quality of the service you are delivering. Take, for instance, you are in the manufacturing industry, right? And Every time, you, 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 let me use uh, which company, Dangote, for instance. Now, there's still the rumors that Dangote was favored by government. Whether it was favored by government or not, it's, it's irrelevant now. There is what we call cement, good cement, right? There are cements that when you mix them, you put them to on a house, they don't kick, they fall off, and all of that. But the man has consistently, consistently brought up good quality products. As such, he won't hire just any kind of persons. Take his refinery, for instance. He is insisting on hiring Indians to run the refineries. And everybody is asking, where are all the Nigerian engineers? Do you understand? Like I said, the Nigerian situation is a very critical one. You need to be very careful. Um, there are times when the thing, uh, you some of these models may not work. You now need to bring in a little innovation to carry it along. So let's move. I'm trying to also, I, I have almost 30 slides. Our time is gone already. Yeah. Now, the best fit model seems to be more realistic than just practice. It's realistic that practice. It's observed that the inescapable conclusion is that what it, but what is best depends. So what you call best may not be best for me. Do you understand? What uh, Mr. Coyote calls best may not be best for me. So there may be merit in different approaches that comes to determine what is actually best. So what is best in the U.S. may not be best in Nigeria. What is best in Nigeria may not be best in China. Now, how we emphasize that it is necessary to avoid falling into the trap of contingent determinism, and he explained that, claiming that the context absolutely determines the strategy. That's another problem. That the concept of best says, when I look at where I am, to determine what strategy I should use. So what uh, Paul is saying that we should always leave room, make room for choices. So Dangote finally built his refinery for Nigeria. And everybody's like, yes, the cost of fuel is about to drop. Okay. The cost of fuel is about to drop. Only for us to wake up one morning and they say the money. And after the, the government have borrowed money, after they've borrowed money, blah, 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 that Gote has to import, you know, I mean, import crude. So you see that he has built based on availability. 
However, he's now seen a situation that no longer first fit does not apply. So let's move. Now, Paul talked about bundling, and I love the way he talked it. Bundling basically talks about putting various things together to determine. He talked about balance scorecard, and I love balance scorecard. It's a beautiful tool. Bundling talks about, okay, so based on where we are now, let's put many indices together. You understand? Balance scorecard used four indices. So like in performance management, you not only talk about performance, you talk about competency, you talk about motivation. In skill acquisition, we'll talk about not just the training for the skill, we'll find a way to incentivize too. In rewards management, if we come to rewards management, it's not just, there's both financial and non-financial rewards. So when you are embodied on an organization, some organizations have various policies. Some will tell you, we don't pay us, we don't do health insurance. However, you are entitled to 200,000 naira for the year as your health benefit that you can go to so so and so hospital, they'll give you a list of hospitals, you can go and spend it today. You understand? So testing framework is also one that is not only based on skills, but also on behavior. So if you studied uh balance scorecard, which some of us, I know some of us have done, you will know that balance scorecard is not just based on skill. So people will say, uh, how do you know that the staff is performing? It's not just about money. So balance scorecard has four points. There's the financial perspective, there's the internal perspective, there's the person's learning and, be, uh, learning and growth, and then there's the fourth one. I've even forgotten the fourth one now. So those four, all of them put together is what makes a complete person. That is bundling. That one model will not fit. We need to adopt A, B, C, D, and they create something new out of it. That is what the bundling talks about. So general HR practices and strategies. Over, over, over the years, there's the high performance management. So this is focused on basically on performance. That's all. This is focused on performance. That's basically it. It is focused on just performance. And this works well in financial institutions. Do you understand? In financial banks, insurance, those people focus on performance. But when you now begin to come to commitment, high commitment management, you begin to talk about what? Government institutions. Because they want to see you around. They want to see your involvement. Who wrote this? Who did this? Then high involvement is a, is a product of both commitment and performance together. Now, look at, the, look at this. Uh, what strategies will this adopt? A local government office, local government area office. For those of us that served in local government or that work there, you will know that nobody is pursuing performance there. <laughs> Everybody's everybody is just commitment come to work do what you can and now that foil has increased everybody has now gone to meet the supervisor okay, i cannot come every day i'll come three days a week is okay, okay yes i shall do my work uh -huh. everybody's happy you will find that in local government if you go up to central bank what central bank of nigeria these days have started changing they are beginning to adopt the performance model the same thing with water board so I did a training for Portacourt Waterboard. Portacourt Waterboard has been successfully almost 100% privatized now. So they, are, they also are focusing a little more on performance models. Innocent. Innocent is just out there to sell. <laughs> he is producing cars, he's selling. Very recently, I saw a flyer that uh, if you're a business owner, you want to sit with him, have a talk with him in the month of uh, October or November. I'm not very sure. He's having a dinner for business owners and all of them. And it's just 200,000 naira. That's another, I've got, that play, at least on the group I was, there were about 200 CEOs. And I know, as of today, the number of CEOs that have registered are more than 50. That's on just one group. Only God knows what other groups have done. That's another income avenue for him. So let's move. I try to be as fast as possible to cover as much as I can. So specific strategies in HR, human capital, this is focused on the people. They are focusing on attracting people and then producing reports on those people. So you need to produce reports, ah, these people are this, they are that, regular production of reports on people. On is it, a, are they performing well? What are they adding value? All those kind of things, you understand? Then another strategy is knowledge management. This talks about knowledge sharing 
institutional uh, memory. So in the organization that puts knowledge management high up, you see that they have a lot of older people. They will have three, four, five generations in, among their staff. You get, because they need to sustain institutional memory. They don't just suck any out. That's why you have the likes of Union Bank, First Bank that have been around for a hundred years. Go the they still part of their, the things they've done hundred years ago that they're still doing now. Why? They value knowledge management. Corporate social responsibility. Those that are careful about how they look outside. Employee engagement, organization development, resourcing, and various things, employee well-being. So people, all they're after is my people, my employees shall, will shall be okay. So they keep increasing salaries, creating, uh, making the office conducive, this and that and that and that. And in the middle of all of this, some people want to compete. And be careful what you copy. All right, so what are the criteria for an effective HR strategy? Number one, you focus on the business need. So bottom line, like Paul said, your HR strategy must focus, must align with the business strategy. Our business is leaving Nigeria because we can no longer afford diesel. So we need to wind down within the next three months. HR needs to create a strategy for winding down and of body staff within the next three months. Do you understand? Uh, Data-driven and evidence-based uh, so anything that is done in the organization, there has to be evidence. Yeah, you have to provide justification. It has to be actionable. It has to be implementable. Actionable, implementable. Somebody can pick it up and work with it. Coherent and complementary of other strategies. complementary of other strategies. And then it considers all stakeholders. It is important for me to state here that HR, as much as HR is a major strategy, I mean, it's major stakeholder, in an organization, you are not the only stakeholder. There are plenty of people, there are plenty of departments, and there are plenty what we also call intricate stakeholders. We'll get to that somewhere. So how do you formulate strategy? How do you build your HR strategy? The first thing is from inside out. So you want to, first of all, link it to the overall business dream, then people, then your technologies. Can you understand? So from inside out, oh, what is happening in our company today? Okay, the people, okay, we are having Jackpa. If you are, if you work in an organization where Jackpa is happening frequently, so you are having a high turnover of staff, and it's not because of anything bad you get. It's just because of the economy. People are leaving your company for greener pastures. So you, you can formulate strategies based on that. So, for instance, I worked with a hospital. It's a UK based, the CEO is based in the UK. And we had a lot of staff leave at the beginning of Japa. We had, we woke up one morning and we had the other staff. One morning, in one week, I lost about 20 something. And out of that 20 something, more than 20 traveled out. So, when I did it, I did a report to my man and I made a recommendation. I was like, we might need to look at our strategy again. Do we need, can we create something to ensure that people don't just go? And then we are left hanging, getting skilled doctors these days in Nigeria is another thing entirely. So we sat down, we had a meeting with, with our team and all of We created a strategy. So everybody that wants to leave, you are allowed to leave, number one. But however, we want to create a way that we can create a job for you, a job will be waiting for you in the UK. Our uh, chairman is, works as a consultant psychiatrist in the UK. He has his own hospital, a 200 bed hospital, psychiatric hospital. So he was like, so we called him, we were like, sir, everybody that has worked for up to four years upwards and they want to jackpa, can we create a recruitment company in the UK that we request for them so it makes their documentation and all the processing easy? And he was like, oh, that's it. So we linked it as a form of reward. That was an inside out approach. So LDP, if you're a medical doctor, you're a nurse, you're a psychologist, this, and you want to travel out, apply to HR. HR will fast track the process for you and that. That's all. And we had close to 60 people that were ready to leave. 
plus 260. And what did we do? We just quickly, we knew. So it gave us what? An insight into the future that if we didn't do that, most likely we would have woken up again. Maybe another 40 or 50 of them would have been ready to go. So what we just did is that it has given us, our recruitment team went to work and we closed that bit. So the second model is outside in. Now you have looked at your business. You now look at what is my customer looking for? Because every business has a customer. So you need to know what your customers are because HR, we are business partners. We are no longer just people now. HR must work with the business. You must find ways to make the business profitable. Yes, the days of uh, it's just fine. No, 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 those days are over. Long gone. So you look at your customers. What are your customers doing? What kind of people are your customers recruiting? Then you look at your, cost, uh, your customer. What kind of requests are your customers making? Then what kind of people are your competition recruiting? They're recruiting masters holders and all you are recruiting is just BSC holders. Do you understand? So all of that as models for you to work with. Now, very importantly, there is no great strategy anyway. There's only great execution. I love this by Grattan. There is no great strategy, only great execution. Now, implementing all these things are just, it's, it's where the real work is. Developing the strategy, no, no big deal. Implementation, that's where the real work is. So let's go to, First of all, you want to plan. You want to plan. You want to. You, have, you need to analyze your environment. What is the HR demand for casting? If I don't know if you've ever heard of it, HR demand for casting. What is the demand for people in the market? What is the demand for chartered accountants now? The demand for HR managers now. What is the demand for, you know, IT skills? What is the demand for hardware skills? What is the demand for software skills? All of those things. Then the next thing is, what is the supply? Because as long as you know, there's always the demand side. There must always be a supply side. What is the supply? Is it available? And trust me, uh, supply is always lower than demand. Skilled people are not available, so supply is always lower than demand. Then you now look at the gap. What is the gap? So all of this you can do it in your organization to. Do. Just to do as you are ending, if you look at your environment, you do an environmental analysis. What is the skills that are in demand for the next year? What skills are in demand in your environment? What skills will your organization require? Is it available? That's the supply analysis. Then what is the gap? Then action, you take action because you must always take action. Environmental analysis talks about what? I've talked about it. Trends, labor market conditions. You need to consider the labor market. NLC is going on strike on Tuesday. It's a condition you must consider. Your company culture, globalization, personal and VUCA. I don't know if you know them, but that's your first assignment. So go and find the meaning. I don't want to talk about the meaning, but those are things that affect your business, whether we like it or not. A lot of companies have shut down because of these two things, personal and VUCA. Personal is a, it's a, it's an analysis every business does. And VUCA are things you should consider. Your organization. So that's your first assignment. So let's go. So those that are graduates of economics will understand the beer and the bull analysis. It talks about forecasting. What is the future of work? Today we are already talking about hybrid work, working from home. AI is coming in. You know, it's very interesting. I did a recruitment very recently for a principal of a school and uh, I, after doing the recruitment, I now requested, I give them, a, during the recruitment, I give them an assessment to write and then submit to the 24 hours. You won't believe it. So people submit, people wrote, there was this particular one that picked my attention. There were six questions. And this person had, each question had a page. I said, a page per question. When I saw it, I was like, this is too good to be true. But I've also learned that when it is too good to be true, when it seems too good to be true, it is actually too good to be true. So what happened? I just took the question and I went on chat GPT and I posted it there and I searched word for word. My auntie copied everything on chat GPT and sent back to me. And I was like, uh, I'm sorry, 
At least you should have tweaked it a bit too. You understand? Tweak the things more. What for what? Future of work, that's the reality. I'm going to chat GPT to go and learn how to do surgeries, to go and learn how to negotiate a deal and all of that. Then trend analysis. I've talked about supply analysis. How do you assess your... Uh, if there's something you must learn, learn how to assess people's competencies. Mm -hmm. The competencies of your staff, do an assessment. What can my people do? What can't they do? Because it will help you, it will, it will help the company save money. There are people that have been hired in companies that they don't, they, they've exhausted their usefulness and they need to leave. I'm being realistic. Gap analysis. How do you identify the gap between the future demand and current supply? First of all, you must identify where you are. Evaluate the future state. So whether we like it or not, as it is, the dollar is going to keep it. Fuel is not coming down. Diesel is not coming down. That is our current state here. What is the future? The future is that in the next one year, there is no economic indices stating that these things are going to come down. The way the Nigerian economy is going, there is no indices stating that these things are going to revert backwards. So what do we do? We evaluate it and then we address the gap. How do you address the gap? You formulate HR plans. You formulate plans. So can the company successfully continue to pay salaries at this rate? Can the company successfully retain this staff at this rate we are going? And then you give it to, for strategic review. So you take it to management. Let's review these things that we are doing. Let's review it and look at it together. Can we continue on this trend? And very importantly, on every strategy, is you need to monitor and evaluate it. On every strategy you do develop, on every strategy you recommend for your organization, monitor it. A lot of organizations this year alone, the company I work for, we've changed strategy three times, three times in one year. Why? Because indices are changing. People are changing. I did an interview for somebody very recently. It was his, and the salary was 70K. 70,000 naira, sorry, 70,000 naira. And this guy did well, well, very well. He was in the finals of it, top three. So I recommended him. So I, he was one, it was my first pick anyway. And we, he called me and he was like, he wanted to ask, he had not, at that time, he hadn't even known what the salary was. And he asked me, what was his salary for the role? And I told him, I told him this is the salary. So he was like, ah, no, he can't take 70,000. That he has to turn it down. Nah, we shouldn't consider him. And I was asking in my head, you don't have a job. We knew he didn't have a job. He started at home. So why are you turning down 70,000? So he was like, if he sits at home, he makes 100. Between 100 and 120, he's sitting at home. That's what he makes. So why should he take a job of 70? It doesn't make sense. Do you understand? Those are realities in the market. This is a graduate position. So for you, monitor your strategy. How is it performing? Monitor, collect data, review, make reports. Look at the trends. A lot of trends are going on in Nigeria right now. There are trends in the petroleum sector. There are trends in the agricultural sector, in all the sectors. And all these trends are going to affect the people that work for us. And they're going to affect what? Your HR, your HR uh, policy and strategy. Do you understand? All right. What are challenges in HR strategy and planning? Changing workforce demographics. Workforce is changing. So today we have people turning down jobs of 70,000. Why? Because sitting at home, all he needs to do is to call uncles, call aunties, call other brothers. By the time they all said 10, 10, 20K, 100K is complete. At least they know that he doesn't have a job. And he has given all of them his CV for them to find him a job, and they've not gotten him a job yet. So it's justified. Economic issues, regulatory issues, you know, uh, technological advances. Like I said, technology is taking up a whole lot of stuff. 
Now, this is a case study. We'll get back to it. I want us to look at it when we finish. So let me just move on with it. So what are best practices? Practices. What do we want to do? Like I said, best practices is involve key stakeholders. So I talked about intricate stakeholders earlier. And I'm going to tell you about it. This is from experience. So a company hired was hired, making a hiring and a royal father, they set up a company in a particular local and the royal father in that area sent them a list of people to hire and the HR manager turned it down and he didn't consult the management sort of. I don't, I don't know the details, maybe he consulted or not, but the list was not followed. And the first thing the royal father did was he wrote a letter to the governor and it seems him and the governor in good terms, they revoked the land that was given to the company <laughs> to do their business, they were revoked by the governor. And that was the beginning of the end for them. And the company management had to go meet the governor. The governor told them, that was when the governor now told them to go back and go and meet the royal father. And then that was when the whole thing. So you see, this we call them intricate stakeholders because there's nothing you can do about them. They can determine the future of your business and they can determine whether they will determine whether you will continue as a business or whether you will not. They are stakeholders, royal fathers. Uh, for those who've worked in a financial institution before, you have people that are sending their children. We call them management children then. So it's not that he's a direct son of the management, but he's a favor done to somebody. You know, when 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 you see all those adverts and they say we are equal opportunity employer, they will call everybody. And we know it, it is very common in Nigeria. These stakeholders, you need to, even in your HR policy, you need to consider them. While drafting your recruitment strategy, consider them. That you will be given a list and you have to consider the list. You need to also consider continuous learning and adaptation. Why? Because the environment we are in is constantly, the business world is constantly changing. Things are changing at the speed of light. We are changing at the speed of light so rapid that it's almost impossible to catch up with. So you need to consider continuous learning. And if you've checked balance scorecard before, you know that learning and development a critical portion of balance scorecard. Then you also want to talk about data-driven decision-making. You do not make decisions out of the air. There has to be data backing it. Data must back it. So if you say management should take a particular procedure, if you say this is the strategy you want to engage, what is the data behind it? You want to, you are recommending a hybrid work. What is the data you have? What have you conducted? What studies have you conducted? What is your research data you have as evidence to show that hybrid work will be good for your organization? So before I conclude, let's go back to our case study. All right. Um, our case study is very simple. Tech Innovators Incorporated. It's a startup company that specializes in developing cutting edge software solutions for various industries. It was founded three years ago, and the company has experience and its workforce has expanded from 20 to 150 employees in this three years period. The company continues to scale. The CEO, Sarah Ogundele, recognizes the need for a robust HR strategy and planning process to support the organization's growth and long-term success. Now, here are their challenges. Challenge number one, talent acquisition. The company faces challenges in attracting and retaining top talent in a highly competitive market. Number two, culture and engagement. 
maintaining the startup's innovative and collaborative culture as the organization grows is a concern. Number three, leadership development. There is also need to develop the leadership skills and fill in critical roles because remember, they are scaling. And then number four, compliance policies. As the company expands, it must ensure HR policies and practices are compliant with labor laws. So our problem is how do we solve these problems? So I'm going to all right, have I stopped sharing? Yes. So can I have volunteers on how to solve this problem? Okay, I need to share back so that you can see the challenges, right? Can I have volunteers? I don't want to call names, so. Can I have volunteers on how to solve these problems? In three years, they have grown from 20 to 150 staff. These are the major challenges they are facing. How do we solve it? Volunteers, volunteers, who do I call now? Let me see. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. K, the, the groups are from group one to what? One to twelve. Sir? One to twelve, sir. Sorry, I didn't hear you well, sir. We have groups one to twelve. Great, group one to twelve. All right. So let me pick group three. Who is group three team lead? Group three, we will pick the first question. Group five, we will pick the second one. Group seven, we will pick the third one. And then group 12, we will pick the last one. Group three, group five, group seven, and group 12. Sorry, I, I guess if the group lead is not on this call, any member, anyone in the group may also come up. Sorry, sir, I'm not hearing you very well, so it's really cracking. Okay. Is it I said me? if the group if the group leads are not on the call, then the, some members of the groups can as well make their contributions. Okay, so I'm still not it's really breaking. Okay, is it better now from your side, sir? Yes, it seems it's better now. Okay. I said if the group leads are not on the call, then some members of their groups can as well respond on their behalf, on behalf of their groups. Okay, you said some members of the group can volunteer, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, so let's go. Group three. Group three, who is who is talking from group three? Or if group five is ready, just let us know. Ah, everybody have kept quiet. Too. Please share the question again. Hello? Ah, you, are asked to, you are asked to project the case study, the questions again, or the problems. Okay, so the problems what is problems? for group three. They are facing the challenge of attracting and retaining top talent. For group five, the challenge of maintaining innovative and collaborative culture. How do they solve that? In group seven. The challenge of leadership skills to fill critical roles. How do they stop solve that? And the group uh, twelve compliance challenges. Um, my name is Susan. I'm the group lead for group twelve. Okay. 
Yes. Yeah, so regarding the, the compliance and policies, the challenge. Okay, I'll give a case study with my organization. We have this challenge as well, like with um, um, employees being compliant with some of the um, um, policies that we implement. So be firm on it and put um, like, um, how do I call it? Like um, if this policy is there would be, um, what's the word for it? The, um, oh. Hello, Susan. Yes, hello, I, I'm here. Yeah, come back. Okay. Okay, so I'll give a scenario. We have a no, no baby on some time. We've talked about it like um, employees are not allowed to bring their babies to work. Um, that issue because they come and they complain, oh, there's nobody that I have to leave the baby with and stuff like that. So we have to come up with a, a strategy Make it definite that going forward, that there are not going to be no baby, no babies allowed on duty. So it's either you are coming with um, um, a nanny alone, or you would stay back at home till your child is grown enough or old enough to be on his or her own on her own before you can. The policy we had to put in place to ensure compliance. So we had to be strict and firm on it. Like, this is the repercussion. If you don't adhere to these rules, these are the consequences for it. So it's either you are staying back at home enough to, be, um, to stay on its own, then you can reapply to the organization. Or you come with a nanny for, to look after your child when you are doing your um, duties. So with that way, we were able to enforce that no baby on duty policy. So I don't know if I'm in line with the question asked. Hello, Mr. Shula, are you back? You are muted, Mr. Shula. Okay, he had to log out and log back in because he wasn't hearing us very well. Let's just, while we wait for him to respond, someone else can go as well based on the question. Can we still remember the, the questions he asked? I guess all of you should be able to talk because you've been activated to be able to talk. Yes. Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Tinoa. I want to present group three. Go ahead, uh, I, think, I think the question he asked is about retaining top tech talent for the complaint. Hello? Okay. Yes, okay, go so, ahead. Uh -huh. So what I want to suggest is that in that, uh, number one, this is about recruitment. I would, I would, first of all, I would like to, we want to redefine the recruitment strategy. How do we recruit tech talent for the organization? One, I would need to analyze my hiring funnels. Am I, are we hiring the right candidate for the job or we are hiring on the performance candidate? And again, employee engagement. Get to know what is keeping them and get to know what they can we can do to improve or to retain them in the complaint so that they will not go. Then I will need to also consider our metrics, the metrics that we are using. 
concerning how we recruit for the organization since we know that our 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 audience our target in our company is tech guys then we need to consider our mode of working too because most of these tech guys most of them usually prefer remote or hybrid so we need to consider that when we are recruiting them and the last one is that i want to uh, say or point out there is concerning the change the uh, the culture fit of the organization so we look into that so that we can we can try and boost our retention rate for the tech guys for the company thank you okay before you leave um i you did mention people on this call who are not familiar with hr terms that much what okay explanation what specific metrics are you talking about recruitment metrics then tell us then cost tell us of hires. Of metrics yeah. go ahead cost of hires cost by hire can you hear me yes go ahead time to fill cost by hire time to fill time to hire quality of our hires those are the metrics i'm trying to talk about sir okay now like i said what is a metric or what are metrics of those who don't know what they are that's what i'm saying just explain it okay i should i should explain what metrics is or what are the metrics that i need to i didn't get your question very what well. metric just explain for the sake of some other members of the team of this training okay i should explain what metrics is Yes. Metrics, like, metrics in my own term or in, for my own opinion, they are like key, key, key things that we need to get that we need to check, like in the indicators, data, something like that. All right, thank you Hello? very much. I, I, I said, I said that because care it's not just enough for us to use certain terms we also need to okay. be mindful of the fact that we're not all on the same level and some okay. of us go to these terminologies so when i oh. ask to explain it's not because i want to pick on you it's because i know there is someone on this call yeah, that is we are all in. i understand you yeah we thank you i understand you yeah so what's the next group Okay, so for group five, I'm representing group five. Go ahead, please. Okay, so our question was to maintain an innovative culture. So in order to sustain this, what the strategy we need to put in place is to recognize workers' contribution through a reward system. So take, for instance, an employee brings um, an innovative idea that leads to um, an increase in the profit of the organization. So you have to reward such employee. Then also, in order to ensure that other employees of the organization also become skilled and innovative, we also have to embrace a learning culture. And this can be possible when we create learning development programs for um, the employees of the organization. So it could be a weekly training, it could be a monthly training, a training that, that is sustainable, that you know in the long run, such it will bring value to the organization as a whole. So that's how I think we can sustain, we can maintain an innovative culture in the organization. Thank you very much. Um, any other group? As group seven said, don't say anything. Group no. seven. No, I Please think they're the one number three. So group seven, let's have you.
Okay, hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, ma. Yes, we can. All right, good afternoon. My name is Kewe. I'm the um, assistant um, group coordinator for group seven. Okay, so um, now our question is um, the need to develop leadership skills internally to fill critical role. First, we have to understand that um, leadership is developed through practice, through motivation, coaching, mentorship, and the rest of it. Now, for us to be able to develop, um, to be able to for, for us to develop leadership through um, and having them to replace critical rules, we have to monitor them. Hello, Kewe. I guess someone in from the Sorry, same group. I guess someone from the same group can take it off from here. Hello. Okay, Tosan, since I can see you wanted to say something earlier, let's have your contribution on the Tosan Akunde. Hello, uh, can someone else, can I jump in? Go ahead, Franklin, go ahead. All right. Um. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just I um, want to add a few things to what um Kelly was saying. For leadership development, for you to to grow your leaders in in an organization, there should always be um, a succession plan. It's very key to to developing um, leaders from inside the organization. And it's easier and it's better when you groom um, persons from the organization for leadership position within an organization than bringing someone from outside. Because there's a, a, someone who has been in the system for a longer time, it's easier for that person to blend to the culture and um, the way things have been done around the organization than someone coming from outside uh, that is putting aside experience and whatever the person is coming in with. So for leadership development, it is critical, very important to always have um, a training plan that is geared towards developing um, individual talents inside the organization to be able to attain and take up leadership roles. Thank you for your Good contribution. Good afternoon. I was told that. OK, Tosa, go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. I went out to read I want to right. tell Kelly to know what happened. She said she's having that issue. Okay, so um, my little contribution on what can be done to develop leadership internally. I think one of the things we can do as an organization and one of the things that help is succession planning. The moment we notice that there is someone, if there are key roles and we don't want there to be a gap with anybody we and we identify, uh, let's say, like a top performer in the organization or someone that we feel like would be best fit if the person currently occupying the role is not there. We start to invest in such people. We look at them and we start to um, help them to probably, if they are not very strong yet, even if we feel like they are very strong, we still send them for trainings. Um, we can start to cultivate their strengths and help them to improve on their weaknesses till we get them to become the 
people that we want them to substitute. They become the leaders that we are expecting them to be. And also, other than succession planning, I believe in an organization, the moment we identify a top talent, a high performer, it is wise to, in, to have a to invest in such people by training them, um, you know, giving them opportunities to be able to, to do a lot. Because most of the people that are top talent, once they have, once they don't actually have enough to do, most of them become bored on the job. So, and all, another thing we can also do for these people is have a stay interview with them. We engage them, know what they need, know, and also, um, Why right, this day interview, we get to discuss with them, we ask them what their plans are, and also we also get to share what our plans for them is. Some of all these things, we actually help to develop the leadership skills, internal leadership skills, and also help to retain them. If most people that resign know that the organization actually have a plan for them, they most some of them would, which is most most organizations wait for when some of their top talent is about to resign. That's when they see them and say, Oh, and we actually have this plan for you, you know, and that makes it feel as if, Oh, so if I've not submitted my resignation, you will not have um, known that you wanted me to do this. But when we discuss with them and let them know that these are some of the plans we have for you, number one, it helps them to actually work on themselves and. Also, it's increased their loyalty to the organization. And they start seeing themselves as a leader, irrespective of where they are present. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. While we wait for Mr. Adetiba for his closing um, remarks, let me say this very well. As HR professionals, there's nothing called the staff. Then there's nothing called the management. We are the link between the staff and the management. When the management has not deliberately put anything in place and it is only when people resign, then it simply means that HR has a role to play. However, Frank said something about recruiting people, managers from outside. It depends on your strategy per time. And I guess that's the crux of what Mr. Adetiba has been talking to us. There are times that you deliberately bring people from outside. One. Number two, except you're in the civil service, a lot of people really has found out, especially the millennials and the Gen Zs, they have found out that the best way they can rise and rise very fast is when they job ship. And you realize that when someone stays in an organization for 10 years, he may be an officer for 10 years with little increment salary. But when that same person works in the place for one year, jump, jump to another place, before you say, Jack, the person has become a senior manager. So. A, a generation now knows that the only way you can derive value from organizations is when you jump ship. But your strategy as, as a team of HR professionals is what begins to now also enhance some employee experiences or some people experiences where you work. That's the first one. Two, when you talk about um, leadership, employee, leadership development or employee development, there are certain things you need to have at the back of your mind. That word is not an abstract thing. It's connected to a whole lot of things. And that's why we're talking about the integrated approach to strategy. Number one, you can't talk about leadership development if you don't have a very solid performance management system in place. Without a very solid performance management in place, you can't know who the top performers are. It is after you have identified the top performers that you can begin to set a an effective succession plan in motion. When you pick the top performers and you put them in the succession plan and you design a system that says that, okay, this is their current skill set of Hello, sir. We can't hear you. Am I the only one that can not hear Mr. Kyle? I, can, I can't hear him, too. Yeah, I can okay. hear you, too. Thank you. 
Maybe it's not work issue. Can you hear me? All right, sorry. Yes. Network B. Now, the reason okay, I... I raised... All right, network B. Now, the reason I raised this is we're talking about strategy. And you need to know that in HR as a functional discipline, there are things that you cannot do alone. It is interconnected. When you talk about leadership development, in an organization, then you need to begin to think about career progression. You need to think about performance management. The outcome of your performance management should feed into your training plan or your training strategy. It should also feed into your succession plan because your training plan or your training strategy is to support your succession plan and be able to help your people to begin to bridge their gaps. When someone has performed below acceptable level, you have your performance improvement plan to set in place. When someone has been identified to be a top performer, you have your IDP, Individual Development Plan, which plugs into the succession plan. And all you are doing is you realize that it peaks from here and there and your, and your reward strategy or your compensation strategy is supposed to now enhance all those such that it will be able to give a kind of experience that you expect these people to have. So when we talk about leadership development, I just said that for you to know that it, it serves to confirm what Mr. Letiba just taught us today, which is it's not a standalone function. It's connected to a whole lot of things. So as we think about a problem, don't think about that problem in, in silo. Think about it in its holistic nature. Then you'll be able to know that, okay, leadership development, this is affected, this is affected. And when you come up with a with a strategy for your HR team or for your HR department, it will be such that will be realistic, not just something that is copied over the internet. It's something that you will be able to relate to and people will be able to relate to, and it will be able to solve problems. The major challenge we have is what most of us do are abstract. They are not realistic. For example, for Susan, when Susan was talking about, was it Susan? When you were talking about people bringing their children to the office, and all that. I know that I have worked in a place where we had to begin to talk about establishing more like a crutch because we knew that most of our staff were in the childbearing stage and it was affecting them a lot and it was affecting the organization. As a result of that, we needed to say, okay, what can we do that we can set up that would help them that, for example, you have a mom who is a nurse who is at work and every two hours has to go to the crèche to go and breastfeed the child. And the crèche is just about, it's about 30 minutes away from where the hospital is. It becomes a problem. But when you are able to establish a crèche within the hospital premises in a safe environment, of course, you realize that the, the, the time it takes for the mother to, breastfeeding mother to commute and come back to work is reduced and her mind will be focused on the job and things will happen. When you develop strategy, you need to know that you are dealing with people, not machines. Finance can develop strategy and think that, oh, it is the sage that is working. But when HR develops strategy, HR strategies are focused on people experiences. And it is something that we need to pay attention to. So don't think about any HR problem in a, in a silo or in isolation. Always see how that problem affects another functional side of HR. I did say to some people yesterday, there was the time we did salary, we did, um, we did redesignation and we did promotion and salary review. You would have thought that salary review would motivate everybody. But for every salary review you, 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 you introduce, just know that there will be some people that will come up with issues. And so because they are integrated, they are interconnected. You need to be able to think in a strategic way that this is not a standalone problem. It's a solution. It's a problem that once you solve might, might create problem in other areas. But the most important thing is for us to be mindful of them and be very realistic about what we are doing. Thank you. Is Mr. Shola back?
All right. I guess he, the last time I chatted with him. Okay, sir. Mr. Adetiba, you can go ahead now, sir. I guess the, the last time he chatted with me was having internet problem. But as we wait for him to, I need us to know one thing. Every time you come to this platform or to this class, please have it at the back of your mind that you are going, you are coming to have a discourse. We're coming to engage one another. And the idea really is, this is not a training as well. This is a coaching program where you are able to ask questions. Before the end of today, your group leaders will send a body to your various groups. That is the case study that you are treating for this week based on what we have taught today. It's not what, it's not what Mr. Tiba gave. What Mr. Tiba gave is the class. But beyond the class, on as a, as a group and turning your latest by Friday to us and we want as you why you also prepare for next week's class we don't want to deal with a lot of theories in this class we want to deal with lots of practical issues and that's why case studies also come into play here if you want to have any question there's an area that you are not clear about before mr Ditiba comes up please drop let's hear you now so that we can address you have the opportunity to ask your question you have is around something, around what we're talking about today, please bring it up. Let's talk about it. For those who are not, who are not practicing HR professionals at the moment, they can learn from your experience and all of us can get better with it. So if you have any question, please, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Chairman Solomon Ogunbi. Okay. So I'll, the contribution I want to make is um, like where I worked before before joining the company I am. When we want to track um, our performance in anything we do, like where I worked before in SOS, Federal Council Limited, we have what we call a uh, policy test every month. If any of uh, HR organization is practicing this kind of thing, you'll be able to track the performance of each of your staff so that in time of sharing responsibility you can easily share responsibility and in, in, in our organization there is some time when we do our policy test like that they see that okay you, you are fitting these departments more than where you are and they will just switch us to any department that they see that we are good at and with that it makes us grow more in our feet than we just being maybe in a recruitment department which is supposed to be in finance or is supposed to be in onboarding and with that we grow part time before coming to where I am now that makes me the head of uh, HR and consultants. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a session on performance management which is going to be very practical. But before we get there, let me say something to you straight. And it's, an, it's a mistake that a lot of us make. You cannot conduct performance appraisal when you have not set clear goals at the beginning of the appraisal cycle. Any performance appraisal that is, con that is conducted when there was no clear performance expectation or target set at the beginning of that cycle, it's going to be merely a vindictive exercise. The reason is simple. You cannot expect me to achieve what you have not informed me I needed to achieve. Now, yes, I understand what you said that you take policy test. Policy test is more of just to get out, to be familiar with policies. In fact, in most cases, it's not the policy that people are mostly interested in. It is the procedural test, your, your standard operating procedure which is what speaks to what people are meant to be doing and how they are meant to do it. Now, you can do that as those. You cannot use that, the totality of that, to be the true reflection of the performance of people. 
what exactly were they employed to do? Based on your business strategy for the period and your HR strategy, which must align with your business strategy for that period, what have you set out for this person to achieve? For example, if you, are, if you work in my team and you are in charge of recruitment, and I had said out for you that my time to fill must not exceed 45 days and my time to hire must not exceed 30 days. For example, it simply means that by the time you analyze the recruitment data for the period, if it is done quarterly or if it is done every six months or annually, by the time the totality of the data you gather for that period is analyzed, I want to be sure that the average of it must not exceed 45 days for time to fill. It is when it exceeds 45 days that I'll tell you have performed below expectation. You, and it is something we need to know. Performance appraiser is not performance appraiser. If there's no established goal at the beginning of this cycle, and if it is not measurable. But one thing we have also seen is that a lot of us set qualitative targets for people. There are targets that are abstract. You can't really monitor them. No. But what we want to see are targets, are indicators, KPIs that are that have like what um, was this Susan that said let, let earlier? Metrics. Metrics are measurable indicators that are assigned to the goals for a period or to the objectives for a certain period. Except it has metrics, you can't assess people on it. Whatever assessment you do on it will be biased, will be sentimental because there's no metric to measure it. So whatever you do, make sure that at the beginning of every appraisal cycle, I don't know what your policy says, but if your policy says that you assess a performance every three months, it means that from you need to set clear expectation in January before you can assess me at the end of March. Then as you are assessing me at the end of March, you need to set a clear expectation in April before you can access me at the end of July. That way, it will be very objective and it will be very open to everybody to know. But if that is not there, that performance, the outcome of that performance appraisal can never be very, very encouraging. And the idea behind my performance appraisal is to see the rate at which the organization is growing, number one, and to see the alignment of individual employees' job to the achievement of the overall goal or objective that the business has set for that period. That's the essence. It's for alignment. It's not for, to vindic it's not for being vindictive. No, it is to say what we are doing as individuals. Does it align with what we have set out to achieve? And the only way we can know is that is by setting clear indicators. Please, you need to know that. That is performance appraisal. What we do in Nigeria, I can boldly tell you in the bulk of the places I've worked and people I've spoken to, is not performance appraisal. It's not performance management, really. We just want to get rid of some people. We just want to dash some people money. So we said, let's appraise people. And by the time we do it, we do, we just favor those we want to favor. But if performance appraisal must be done the way it's supposed to be done, you must have a calendar developed for it, you set your goals, you set your expectations, you communicate the expectations to individual staff. And what you have communicated, you don't wait till the end of the appraisal cycle before you start monitoring. No. The day you set the expectations on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, you begin to give feedback to your staff. Performance appraisal is not meant for you to deal with people to say, oh, you have been messing up all this while. It's time to know. You are meant to say, oh, you are supposed to achieve this. You have not achieved it by now. In between the pre period, you are giving feedback. It is feedback gathering or giving feedback during performance appraisal that makes it interesting that when you now assess someone below, that the person performed below standard, the person won't feel bad because the person has the fact to prove that, oh, okay, I've not really lived up to expectation. People can improve their performances if only managers give them timely feedback. And ask yourself that question. Every time your manager marked you back down, how have you always felt? You would always feel bad because you would have thought, you could have told me this thing earlier. And if I had been told earlier, I would have been better. That is performance management. 
So let's know that for sure. And let's go back and actually check what we are doing if we're truly um, doing the right thing. I don't know if Mr. Shola Adetiba is back for his closing network today. I don't know where you are, but where we are, the city where myself and Mr. Adetiba is network is always an interesting thing for us. So when I have a two-hour meeting and there's no network glitch, I'm always very happy. But please, let's take this conversation back to our groups. If you have any challenge, if you have any question, go back to your group lead. If it requires us supporting you in one way or the other, we will know. You will you reach out, we will support you. But please, no one thing for sure. HR strategy and planning, we've talked about it today. We will share the recording of this class with you like we did last week. But the most important thing, it's not for you to come to class only. The most important thing for you, for us, is that by the next, by Friday, you have a grasp of what HR strategy and planning is, and you can literally develop one for yourself. And I encourage you, as you go into this new week, why don't you just sit down and try to do a sample HR strategy for your company, even though you have not been asked. Just do it. Let someone review it for you. And once you can do it and you get it 70% right, then you know that for sure you can do it if you are called upon at work to do it. And that's how we grow. So I encourage you, number one, I want to say thank you for coming to class. But beyond just coming to class, I encourage you to please get your, your hands on something. If you need any support, reach out to your group leads. If you need further support, reach out to us. We will support you. But get your hands dirty. Try your hands on something. I'm sure on your groups, the attendance, um, the link to the attendance register for today must have been shared on your groups. Please fill your attendance. You have till 2.15 to fill your attendance for today's class. And... Um, I trust that we'll have a wonderful week in our groups. But please, we had less than 25% participation in our respective groups. I'm on all groups, and I see what is happening on, in those groups. The groups were created for you, not for me. And so we want to encourage you to please, encourage your, your group leads are participants like yourself. They've just been given the responsibility to coordinate your group, and we want to appeal to you. Please get busy in your groups because that is where you learn the first time. If we're certain that you will study the material there, what we will bring to this platform will be pure practicals. And because you understand the theory, it will become very useful to you and you'll be able to do those things on your own. On this note, I say thank you for coming to class today. And please sign your attendance register for today. Thank you. See you in your respective groups and see you next week in class. Bye for now. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank you. much. Yeah.